Welcome to China Dispatches, the official podcast of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. This is your host, Jacob Gunter. Today, we're going to be doing a year in review of the year of the rat, um, and what a year it was for all of us. Uh, so today, I'm joined uh, here with three of my chamber colleagues, who will introduce themselves shortly. Today, we'll be talking about some of the things that we thought were the most overhyped, the most underappreciated, and the most surprising things about the year of the rat. And we'll also be looking forward at what kind of things we think you should all keep your eyes on as we enter the year of the ox. So first, I ask my colleagues to introduce themselves, starting with Ziting. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ziting. I'm the uh, head of government affairs uh, at the European Chamber here in Beijing. My name's Carl Hayward. I'm the general manager of the Beijing chapter and director of communications. My name is Esther Cañada, and I work on SME issues at the EU SME Center. And at the chamber, I cover European affairs and standards. All right, thanks all for that quick introduction. For today's episode, we'll be keeping it pretty light uh, as we are at the end of the year, and we're uh, in currently enjoying a nice happy hour at the European Chamber, courtesy of some of the geographic indications that uh, have been provided by different member states for some of our events. And I think Zitting will be talking about that agreement in a bit. Before we get into uh, the meat of the conversation, I think it's worth a quick look back in time at where were each of you at the start of the year of the rat, which I know feels like about five years ago. Ziting, where were you? I was in Shenzhen back home. I came back to Beijing on 5th of February because at the time it was like um, the Chinese New Year has been prolonged and delayed and then extended and then I was thinking, should I come back or not? Because the worry is like, if I don't come back earlier, I might not be able to come back without any further quarantine measure. I think my other colleagues are more familiar with that. That, that we are. Carl, where were you at the start of the year? I was in Hong Kong, and I remained there for the next seven and a half months. Esther? I was uh, in Spain, uh, getting ready for our big annual trip to Brussels, uh, which got greatly reduced for obvious reasons. And one thing that I really remember about uh, trying to come back to China was that when I was looking for flights back, I realized that these were probably the cheapest tickets from Brussels to Beijing that I had ever seen. Yeah, I too was uh, in Spain originally to, to ring in the year of the rat. and. I distinctly remember viewing the painting Guernica in Madrid and getting a phone call from Esther saying, everyone else that's supposed to come to Brussels for work is not able to come. So it was just going to be the two of us. And that was the start of a long odyssey. So with, uh, with that sort of setting the stage, let's move into the, the main conversation that we're going to have today. First question for each of us, uh, what was the most overhyped thing in the year of the rat? Zitting. For me, um, it was the uh, phase one deal between the U.S. and China. It's not only start in 2020, it actually start a bit earlier. But um, I think overall, I, I was a bit like, disappointed with the, uh, uh, the deal because the entire business community are looking for more meat <laughs> from that deal not just buying goods or like increase the trade of goods, but on the other hand, it could also also improve the uh, market access for a lot of the companies. Um, however, I don't think that it has achieved its original goal, e not even in the, I mean, in the trade uh, part, um, the target wasn't really <laughs> met. Uh, yeah, I was disappointed. Yeah, I think it was especially hard for them to meet those targets with some of the energy components, considering at various points throughout the year, the price of oil dropped uh, to negative prices. So, Carl? Most overhyped thing uh, was the Brexit deal that uh, the UK managed to secure eventually. Um, it looked at one point as if they may be leaving without a deal, um, but they went the extra mile and they, they, they got something in the end. As the Chamber said at the beginning of the referendum, the UK would be stronger remaining within the EU. And I don't think we've changed our position on that. I personally haven't changed my position on that. But we respected the democratic process that took place with the referendum. However, my general feeling is that Brexit as a whole was sold as a lie to the British public in many, many ways. 
and I think it's only now that people are starting to feel the effects of it that they realize that there's probably more immediate negative impacts to being out of the union than there was when they were in it. Freedom to live and work between the UK and the EU has ended. Checks on goods going into Northern Ireland uh, its caused a huge fuss in the past couple of weeks. There was one story last week about a truck being detained, I think it was for seven to eight weeks at the border because it was it had a consignment of frozen food and because the trucks that, that, that are going across into Northern Ireland don't tend to be complete loads, they tend to be mixed. I think there was one crate of frozen carrots that they couldn't get the paperwork right for and it was stuck because of that. The UK primarily exports services and I think the freedom to export services now has been uh, greatly curtailed. Services such as banking, architecture and accounting will lose their automatic right of access to the EU market and there will be an autom no more automatic recognition of certain professional qualifications for doctors, chefs, architects. So in general, it's just going to be much more difficult for the UK to sell services into the EU, which was primarily what it did. Esther, what about you? What was the most overhyped thing in the year of the rat? For me, the most overhyped uh, thing in 2020 in the year of the rat was the fact that the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, also known as CAI or CAI, was actually concluded. And now before I lose my job as a European Affairs Manager, let me clarify two things. First of all, I am not saying that the CAI itself is not a milestone in uh, EU-China economic relations, because it is. And secondly, I am not saying that the process towards the conclusion has not been fraught with uh, hurdles and with difficulties. At the same time, I found it really interesting that 10 days before at the end of 2020, people started uh, putting their hands in their heads and uh, running around and saying, oh wow, this is, this is going to get concluded. And another thing that, uh, that I followed with, a, let me be honest, a bit of concern, was the fact that people were just voicing opinions and making judgments before fully understanding and really knowing the content of the agreement. And in that respect, I'm just going to do a little commercial of the European Chamber. And I'm going to say that uh, we have been following the process very closely up to the conclusion. And uh, we have also been uh, collecting uh, feedback from our members. So I would recommend to our listeners that, um, again, they follow uh, what the Chamber has to say on the agreement because it, it's true that it is meant to benefit uh, European uh, jobs and it's meant to create uh, economic growth. But in the end, the primary beneficiaries of this agreement are going to be European businesses. And this is what we are looking at right now. All right, moving on. So from overhyped things to what is the most underappreciated thing in the year of the rat, back to the table. GI product. <laughs> I think, I mean, with the fact that we actually have a, a GI product on our table now <laughs> proves that uh, um, we are all a good supporter of uh, GI. I, I think GI provide, uh, for at least for China, GI provide a new concept how you can uh, promote your products because most of the GI products are agriculture products which are normally in China considered for I mean lower value and cheap products. Um, with the GI you can actually label your products with a much higher price with more value added. I mean, at our 20th anniversary, um, we have this like, we present the GI products from Europe, um, like ham, cheese, and wine, and spirit. And we also presented the uh, GI products from, uh, from Wuhan, uh, tea products. So we provide this tasting, and all, our, all the people who tasted the tea were really like surprised by the quality. So we, uh, I think that's something China to start to uh, re-evaluate how it uh, promotes its agriculture uh, products uh, because I think like in, in, in the US um, there's no GI products actually people are uh, against this kind of like concept 
but um, this is something that EU is doing well. I I I assume that China will really appreciate how to I mean to work with EU in this field. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, and I I would say that uh, I hope that a lot of the Chinese teas um, that come from very specific regions and are made in very specific specific and special ways finally get to break into the the EU market this way. So that rather than just drinking generic uh, bagged black tea or green tea, they get to enjoy these really specific and unique um, flavors. All right, Carl, for you, what was the most underappreciated thing? That decoupling um, isn't actually about companies leaving China, which I think a lot of people thought would be the measure for decoupling. But at the center of it, it's a struggle to control the technologies that are basically going to define uh, economies for the next coming years. So whether it is uh, artificial intelligence or automation or uh, semiconductors that allow uh, manufacture of very, very high-end products, this is basically what the U.S. is trying to uh, maintain an advantage in. It's what China is trying to catch up in. And essentially, this is at the heart of the, of the, the, the struggle, is their need to be able to uh, own these technologies because they're basically going to define industry and industrial output for the next several decades to come. Yeah, and by doing so, it's going to make uh, make it a bit of a nightmare for companies that are trying to, you know, incorporate the best technologies across these different geographies. Yeah, I mean, as we said in our report, this is going to basically force companies to make a decision between either um, one market or the other, or having a sort of a bifurcated system, um, so they can. Um, continue to operate in both markets and either one of those choices is going to be incredibly expensive. Over to you Esther. Thanks Jacob. So for me the uh, most underappreciated thing in the year of the rat was the fact that in spite of a pandemic or perhaps in some sense because of it uh, the EU continued to reinforce its various tools to address distortive practices by third actors. And by third actors, I mean particularly China. So let me just give a couple of examples. On the competition side, uh, we have uh, the development of an instrument that would uh, tackle uh, distortions caused by foreign subsidies. And on the trade side, there is currently a major overhaul of uh, the EU's trade policy going on. Finally, uh, one example that I would like to highlight uh, is the case of uh, R&D, because it's something uh, where uh, there has been increasing awareness uh, in the European policymaker community and where steps are being taken to tackle uh, reciprocity, both bilaterally uh, with China and uh, autonomously uh, through provisions uh, within Horizon Europe, which is the new innovation uh, program uh, by the EU. Yeah, and I, I think um, a, a lot of those autonomous steps are, are likely to continue, even as the EU tries to, to build a bridge with China with the CAI, it's also going to be um, creating this more robust toolkit to, to address other issues. Yeah, for myself, uh, I think the uh, maybe not the most underappreciated thing in the last year, but something that I think has generally been kind of overlooked is the shipping container shortage that emerged at the end of 2020, in which uh, now the price of shipping goods from China to other places has gone up by over 300% and is continuing to climb. Uh, and really what that is is a symbolic of a lot of other issues. First, it's symbolic of the imbalance of trade. China exports so much more than it imports in a normal year uh, such that it's actually usually cheaper, sometimes as expensive, um, to ship a bottle of San Pellegrino from its source in the Italian Alps to Beijing as it is to ship it to Brussels. That's because there are so many filled containers uh, from China going to Europe, um, and there's just simply not enough demand for the goods coming back, so uh, they'll, they'll stuff them full of uh, mineral water and the like. And as a result, a bottle of San Pellegrino here is not so much more expensive uh, than you would find in the EU. So that trade imbalance was really exacerbated by the pandemic, and that produced this shipping container shortage um, in which you have all these empty containers stranded all over the world, and there's an issue of getting them back to China. I think it's also really symbolic of three other big issues. 
The first is reliance concerns. Essentially, all shipping containers are produced in China. So if you're uh, a major shipping um, country or a major shipping company, uh, you essentially have a, an over-reliance concern that has been highlighted by this. A second thing is that it, uh, it shows um, issues with overcapacity. The reason a lot of these containers are built in China is because China has an overcapacity of steel, and that makes it so cheap to produce them here locally uh, that it's impossible for anyone outside of China to competitively build these things. And the third concern is um, sort of the vertical integration of SOEs. Uh, and it's not something we've really seen emerge yet, but I think it's a risk that a lot of shipping companies are looking at. A lot of the producers of these products, or of shipping containers, are either state-owned or they are partially state-owned. Uh, and it raises a question of, will foreign shippers have equal access to the new containers that are being produced, or are they just going to go to Costco, the main Chinese shipper? Uh, which would give them a huge competitive advantage. So again, I don't think it's the most underappreciated story of the year, but it's something that really symbolizes a lot of these issues that have just been brought to our attention because of the pandemic. All right, moving on to our next question. What surprised you the most in the year of the rat, Zeting? I was surprised by the protest uh, in the DC. It's just like you saw the American system actually guarantee that people or uh, provide people the opportunity to voice your different opinions and even your opinions is strongly different from the government or political leaders and people has their channels to voice such kind of disagreement or voice their opinion so I was really surprised that it becomes such a like a big why not a big but such a violent uh, protest no, I, I think we were all surprised that it got that violent um, and that it went from a protest to a riot to an insurrection very, very quickly. Carl? I was kind of gobsmacked at the level of unpreparedness of Europe and UK in particular uh, with their response to COVID. There were very clear warning signs. They saw it coming and they had other models that they could have emulated. I was uh, talking to friends and family around March and they were asking me, is it as bad as they say it is? And I said, yeah, it's bad. Um, but if you take the right precautions and you know you kind of follow the rules, then there are ways of keeping on top of it. And I honestly think there was quite a large slice of arrogance on the part of uh, many of the, the political leaders actually who could have looked at the models of China and one of the leading countries that was doing very, very well in combating it. And they just seemed to try and, and find their own path. It seemed they didn't really heed the medical advice. And there were points when they could have instigated a lockdown and they decided not to. They wanted to respect people's freedoms. It's a delicate balance, I understand. But now we're seeing the consequences of that. Several months later, when we've had the, uh, the, the second kind of wave the number of deaths is just appalling. I mean, it's it's really unacceptable. There's, there's no excuse for it. And I think it could have been avoided had people actually looked at how the countries that had first suffered from COVID had dealt with it successfully and emulated it to the, to the best of their ability. But I think they missed that opportunity and they're paying for it now. Yeah, I was, I was quite surprised um, that, that the country that was the first to develop and approve um, incredibly efficacious vaccines, being the UK, was also uh, that it had such a robust public health and scientific um, foundation to develop those things, was also one that just didn't really handle it. And I, I say the same about you know my own country, the United States, that the gap between the expertise and the action or inaction politically, um, or even at a societal level, uh, I, I thought that gap was really quite staggering. I, I agree. But on the flip side, having a large number of cases gave it an awful, um, I would say, a, an advantage over China, who managed to control it very quickly. And when it came to developing their vaccine, they actually had to go outside of China to be able to test it properly. So I think they were a victim of their own success. Very true. Esther, what surprised you? From my side, uh, we all know that China is not really a leader in public diplomacy. But to be honest, I was actually quite surprised at the faux pas 
that Chinese leaders and Chinese media made this year, uh, well, during the year of the rat, uh, with uh, both their uh, mask diplomacy and uh, their wolf warrior diplomacy. Now with mass diplomacy, I believe that there are two issues. First issue is that there was a lack of reciprocity when it, come, when it came to covering uh, respective um, support provided by other countries to China at the beginning of the outbreak. And then uh, when the outbreak spread it to other countries, China just published a barrage of uh, articles and, and, and tweets saying how, uh, how great they were really uh, by helping these countries, which in many cases had helped China in the first place. Just to give you an example, the EU provided 54 tons of, uh, of medical equipment in the first place to China, and uh, this was barely noticed. Now, I'm not going to go uh, very much in detail onto the wolf warrior diplomacy, but I think that's something that I would like to highlight was how China's strategy of publishing and spreading rumors, conspiracy theories, becoming abrasive uh, when dealing uh, with the issues experienced by other countries and I think that we see how uh, this has failed in uh, the uh, results of a recent Pew uh, survey. Just to give you some examples, in, in, in Germany, uh, uh, public opinion has dropped to 71%, negative public opinion uh, of China. In France, 70%. In Sweden, 85%. If you measure the success of public diplomacy by public sentiment, then I would say that 2020 has been an utter failure for China. I think that the thing that surprised me the most this year was that in August, there was this gigantic, awesome pool party in Wuhan, and frankly, they deserve to have it. And I remember that when, it, when news started breaking, I had friends and family back home, and I had some friends in Europe um, and friends in Australia from all over the world sending me messages saying, "That's crazy! Like that. This is where this is where it started. This is where it was. It was at its worst." Um, and you know, none of these people are wearing masks. And I said, "Well, I had to kind of awkwardly explain to them, like, well, they dealt with it here. Um, they they got through it. They did the perhaps the most intense lockdown in the world. Um, and we may never know exactly what happened there, but it clearly worked." And the sacrifices that those people made meant that they could have their pool party. And again, I think the other thing that surprised me about that was throughout the year, in a lot of the phone calls and Zoom calls I've had with people back in the West, they've been very surprised when they ask me, oh, how, how's COVID in Beijing? How's COVID in China? And I'm like, well, we're mostly back to normal and we have been in many ways. You know, there are little outbreaks here and there that kind of raise the restrictions, but there's there's been a very big disconnect that I think, I think a lot of Americans, at least, which is you know where my family and, and friends mostly are, uh, that they've assumed that if it's bad here, it must be bad everywhere in the world. Um, and, and yeah, they haven't made those connections that they don't, that people aren't reading about this and saying, oh, this, you know, China took care of it, Taiwan took care of it, uh, Vietnam, Australia, uh, Thailand, like there are a lot of countries that have, have done a good job of this, but um, that, that lack of an outward looking view uh, was quite surprising to me. All right, so that's, uh, that's a good look at the year in review. Let's try to be a bit forward-looking going into uh, uh, the year of the ox. Uh, January was already a pretty exciting month for, uh, to end the year of the rat on. Maybe uh, the ox will, will pull us through. So uh, what do you think people should keep their eye on in the year of the ox? Back to Zetin. Um, I think people should still keep an eye on the uh, development of COVID-19. Um, I have a feeling now it seems that COVID-19 has become part of our life, like it starts to normalize in your life. And then, yes, in China, although everything has been taken, or I say the majority, or it's been taken under control, but sometimes there are still cases pop up. And how are you going to deal with that? And what kind of measures? Now in China, you see that different like locations, that different cities dealt with a different way. You always feel that 
it's never going to leave us because it's become part of your life uh, or part of your normal life you feel that um, sometimes you just doesn't care so I feel that we should still um, like be careful on that note I'm gonna pour myself some more brandy <laughs> with that dark note I'd um, like some please <laughs> All right, Carl, what are you, uh, what do you think people should be looking at moving into the year of the ox? Pessimistic again, I'm afraid. I think there's going to be more politicization of the vaccines. I think the deepening divisions that we've seen in the past weeks is just the tip of the iceberg here. I think a lot of people may be envisaged that once we had a vaccination or we had you know, several vaccinations and it started to roll out, that things would get back to normal fairly quickly. Science has already told us that's not going to be the case. It's going to take quite some time to be able to get a level of immunity within the population to make that possible. But I think before then, people will be looking to try to get back to normal lives in terms of travel and business travel in particular. I'm just looking at the next few months of when people would possibly be expecting they may have some kind of immunization passport because they've been vaccinated and whether that will be accepted by certain countries um, or if it is accepted once they get there, will they be allowed to come back? Will they have to get another uh, vaccination in another country? I can see all manner of different problems being uh, thrown up by this. And I don't think it's necessarily going to get easier for the average person because I think there will be increasing politicization of this issue, which is really disappointing. It's the one thing that I kind of had hope that there would be a level of global cooperation on and it doesn't seem to have happened. On to you, Esther. Thanks, Jacob. So from my side, what I would say is, uh, as, we th as we discussed earlier, uh, public opinion is extremely important and has a lot of weight in democratic societies like Europe. And uh, this uh, public opinion is going to play a very important role in uh, processes like the ratification of the CAI, which is going to uh, hopefully take place this year or perhaps at the beginning of next year. Just for our listeners to, to um, understand, the agreement needs to be ratified through the uh, Council of the EU and the European Parliament. The European Parliament uh, and the uh, Council of the EU, again, being democratic institutions where uh, public opinion is uh, very much taken into account in uh, decision making. And public opinion right now on uh, CAI is, uh, I would say, mixed. And there are uh, some legitimate concerns that have, ha that have arisen from uh, some of uh, the issues have that have taken place in China in the past few years, in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang. And there are concerns uh, that the CAI may not be fully addressing these issues. Uh, so obviously the behavior of China in the coming year is going to be crucial uh, when it comes to the ratification or not of the CAI. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is what Europe, what the Commission will do in order to demonstrate to its stakeholders, to the public and to the parliament that it does have a wider range of tools uh, with which they can address the uh, human rights, labor rights issues posed by China. For myself, um, I think the, the main thing people should be keeping their eye on uh, is the TPP. And I know that's not the technical term for it anymore, uh, they've, they've broadened the title a bit, but we all know it is the TPP. Uh, I, I wrote that down about a week and a half ago uh, and was going to say things about it. And literally in the last week and a half, it's gotten back into the limelight because the UK submitted an application to join the TPP, which I think is, is indicative of the sort of grim realities of Brexit. But I think it shows that there is an appetite for these sorts of really broad and really kind of deep uh, agreements and multilateral agreements in a way that that, that deals with structural issues uh, in sort of the the Pacific and 
it wouldn't surprise me if we start to see a bit more interest coming out of Europe. Um, I don't know whether that would amount to the EU um, attempting to enter the TPP, but I can't imagine that people aren't having conversations about this at the moment. And so it, it'll be interesting to see um, as well, does the US try to get back into it? Um, it wouldn't surprise me if Biden does. This is after all sort of a, this was something that was very important to the Obama administration. And even though uh, Hillary Clinton came out against it, I think we all know she was se secretly uh, quite happy with it. After all, she was Secretary of State when a lot of it was being negotiated. But she felt the, the domestic political pressure to back away from it for the campaign. And, you know, China has mentioned that they would like to be a part of it. I don't think that's going to happen. I think the, the necessary reforms demanded by the TPP would have to be watered down for China with its you know, heavily state-led half of the economy uh, wouldn't be able to, to comply with all of those things. But it's, it's going to be a really interesting sort of battleground between different economic systems and different players. So that to me is where our listeners should keep an eye out. Okay, well, that's been our year of the rat in review and looking forward into the year of the ox. Uh, so we obviously hope that everyone has a delightful Chinese New Year. They ring in the new year locally to make sure that we are keeping the pandemic under control. So thanks to my fellow panelists uh, for joining this conversation. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy Chinese New Year. Happy New Year, year. of the Ox.